<clears throat> the Great War, or World War I, starts in uh, August of 1914. And a lot of people involved in that war early at that time thought this was going to be a one and done. People in all of the uh, belligerent powers were lining up in mass to volunteer because they didn't want to miss it. They were afraid they'd be too late and everything would be all over. Well, three years later, 1917, they're talking about this probably going on into the 1920s. So a war that was supposed to be one great battle and done was now dragging on into its fourth year of horrific slaughter. Complicating it would be a pandemic, the likes of which we would not see until you know when, uh, the great flu of 1917-1918, which would wind up killing more than the war would. One of the hopes, of course, of the uh, Allied powers, the Triple Entente, would be the entry of the United States into what later became known as World War I. Uh, we were not interested early on. This was Europe's problem. This was Europe's war. If you remember, Wilson ran on a ticket in which he proclaimed he kept us out of war. Uh, there was a division in this country, go figure, um, when the where the progressives uh, were against our imperialistic adventures. And this would just be one more of them. This would be something that would uh, benefit the great industrial powers. So we were inclined to stay out of it. So what we're going to take a look at Every Son of Liberty, a war to make the world safe for democracy. So, what was our initial reaction? I think I just, yeah, I just had an idea. When this war started, it varied. We had extremely close economic ties, particularly with the Triple Entente. Obviously, we did a lot of our trading with both England and France. Very little with Germany at that point in time. Cultural ties. Cultural ties were many. Uh, obviously, English heritage, uh, our connection with France, dating all the way back to the, the revolution. Uh, you have a great many Irish over here or who are not pro-British by any stretch of the imagination. As a matter of fact, Ireland came close to uh, attempting to enter on the side of the uh, central powers. And that, that in itself is another story. And then, of course, we have the people who wish to remain neutral. So this was a split uh, that was going in many different directions. However, the straw that would eventually break this camel's back would be unrestricted U-boat or submarine warfare. This was a new weapon that was entered into uh, at the beginning of World War I, a weapon that had always been around. Uh, the first attack by a submarine would be during the American Revolution in New York Harbor when a uh, underwater vessel called the Turtle snuck up on a British ship and attempted to blow it up. Unfortunately, the mine uh, dislodged itself and blew up the Turtle, but be that as it may, that was the first attempt. During the Civil War, of course, the United States uh, would see more advancement in the area of Unterseebooten warfare. But now, by World War I, this became a big deal. If you take a look at the map in the lower left-hand corner, you will see a zone that Germany enacted. They didn't have enough ships to literally blockade all of England, but they were telling any ship, any ship, neutral or not, that entered into that zone would be subject to attacks by the German U-boats. And the U-boats were extremely effective. By the time we entered the war, England was near 
uh, total collapse. This is the prime example of unrestricted. And that would be the sinking of the giant ship Lusitania. The Lusitania was a commercial ocean liner. And it was leaving New York Harbor with thousands of uh, tourists on hand who were going over to England. Why the heck you would want to tour England during a war, God knows, but be that as it may. However, in violation of what were generally accepted uh, rules of warfare, the British were packing the bottom of the ship with war supplies. So this passenger liner was also in part a military vessel. The British knew, the Germans knew they did that. The Germans knew, the British knew that the Germans knew. So what happened? As you boarded the ship in New York Harbor, you were given flyers by the German ambassador telling them they were going to sink the ship. So it was a bullseye marked for a long, long time. And eventually, in May of 1915, the Lusitania would be sunk. Over 1,000 people would go to their watery graves. 124 of them, as you see there, were U.S. citizens. Now, don't make this mistake. Is this an example of unrestricted submarine warfare? Absolutely. Is this the reason that we entered the war? No, not the sinking of this particular ship. Take a look at the date. It's May 1915. We don't declare war until April of 1917, but it is a prime illustration of what this was doing. And of course, the British made hay with it. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify. Well, Wilson was going to send a number of sternly worded notes to the Germans, telling them basically to stop this. While he was speaking before Congress, news of the sinking of another liner. And again, 25 of those uh, died and two were U.S. citizens, made its way to the floor of Congress. So they approved Wilson's verbal response. As a result of that, you're going to find that the Germans will pledge. These were called the Arabic and Sussex pledges. That Germany will not sink liners without ensuring passenger safety. And this was a commonly accepted, uh, again, rule of warfare. Gentlemen's war, if you wish. Now, uh, the British were not above playing below the line of acceptable behavior themselves. They would take some of their uh, military vessels, armed to the teeth, put up fake canvas sides, hiding their decks, and make them appear as if they were passenger liners or just ordinary merchantmen. When the Germans would surface to announce that they were going to sink the ship and for everybody to get off the ship before they sunk it, well, down would come the canvas sides. Their guns would open up and sink the German U-boats. So the Germans said, okay, enough of that. If, we're not, if they're not playing by the rules, neither will we. So eventually, the Arab and Sussex pledges would be thrown by the boats. In 1916, public opinion started to turn. One of the individuals attempting to swing that opinion, if you will, towards war, you can see pictured right there, it's our old friend, Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt, of course, was the boogeyman as far as Wilson was concerned. And Roosevelt uh, chastised Wilson continually for his weak stance on the war. Our ships were being sunk. The cultural and economic ties were growing. 
uh, as far as the central powers were concerned. And you have the beginnings of what is the Russian Revolution. Now, what did that have to do with our entry into the war? Well, she, Russia, was the only major power that was not a democracy of some type. And eventually when Russia would leave, that made this an all democratic side in terms of the warring nations. Wilson uh, was very sensitive towards that. And now again, keep in mind, there were a lot of smaller countries. You know, we talked about the central powers, we talked about the triple entente, every nation in Europe, including Portugal, Armenia, uh, Kosovo, were all involved in this. Finally, in April of 1917, after two things happened, one, sinking of more ships, Germany figures by this time, uh, the United States is eventually going to enter the war. They can't stop it. But by going back to unrestricted submarine warfare, they're hoping that they can marry that with new actions they're going to take on the Western Front. And in so doing, what would happen then, of course, would be the defeat of the Triple Entente before America could make her might felt. So they gamble, knowing that the United States is going to come in anyway, just making them come in a little bit sooner uh, while they attempt to very quickly defeat the remaining powers. On April 2nd, 1917, President Wilson asked for a declaration of war. This was going to be called by many people who were opposed to it, Mr. Wilson's War. Not the United States versus Germany. This was Mr. Wilson's On war. April 2nd, 19... So we announce that we're going over there. Send the word, send the word over there. Now, if you're thinking that I'm going to break into song, you're sadly mistaken. There you see some of the propaganda that was put throughout the United States. Halt the Hun, buy liberty bonds, buy government loans. You know, you can't fight this war on bread alone. You need guns. We are totally, thoroughly unprepared for this war. We don't send troops over for almost six months. And when they do, they're mostly going to be supplied by England and France. Early on, most of the planes that we flew, English and French made. Most of the guns, uh, ammunition, cannons, etc., all coming from those countries, not from our own industries in the beginning. It was not until the summer of 1918 that U.S. forces began to make a significant difference on the Western Front. In the fall at San Miguel, and in the final campaign of the Meuse Argonne. New technological advances included tank warfare. Again, yeah, these were things that we were just not ready for. And our training was inadequate. We rushed men over there without proper training. And this was going to prove in some early cases to be a disaster. It was not. At home, there was another war being front. Formed. This was going to be the creation of the CPI, the Committee on Public Information. Its job, uh, as headed up by the Wilson appointee, George Creel, would be to spread propaganda throughout the United States, to mobilize public opinion to support the war, work or fight. But this man, George Creel, decided to take it a step further. Not only would we promote support for the war, we would fight those who did not support it. People are going to be arrested. Uh, laws will be passed, such as the uh, new Alien and Sedition Acts, which allowed the United States to uh, arrest people who criticize the war, uh, 
on a, on a very minor level. One post office worker, for example, in the Midwest, when criticizing Wilson's handling of the war, was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison. Imagine everybody under Trump that criticized him being arrested and thrown into prison. You'd have to build an entire separate nation just to house the inmates. So mobilization, a difficult point for any country that's about to go to war. Public opinion, then you have the WIB, the War Industries Board, headed by Bernard Baruch. Baruch was Jewish, uh, which was a large step for Woodrow Wilson, who was both uh, anti-black and anti-Semite. But nonetheless, Baruch would mobilize American industries to support the war. The railroads would be nationalized. This was something, of course, that the populists and some progressives had pushed for, meaning that the railroads would be taken over by the government. And that way, they could be used more effectively and more efficiently to support the war effort. The beginnings of the Great Migration, how scores of Southern African Americans would start streaming into Northern cities to find jobs in the war industries. So the war is going to have a tremendous impact on the domestic progress within this country. Now, the war scare, which is about to take place, which is a preliminary to what later on in the 1920s is going to be called the Red Scare. Those two laws, the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, would uh, again, give the president and the government tremendous power in fighting what they thought would be spies coming over from the central powers. And in case, some cases they did. And they did sink ships and cause damage uh, to some American industry. The Sedition Act, where it was illegal to openly oppose the war in print or word. And in the case, Schenck versus the United States, which involved uh, some political opponents to Woodrow Wilson, they criticized, again, U.S. entry into the war. And, of course, uh, they even encouraged young men not, not to register for the draft that had been instituted. This went all the way to the Supreme Court, claiming this was a violation of freedom of speech. But the Supreme Court ruled that if there is a clear and present danger in the use of that free speech, for example, if you were to walk into a movie theater and yell fire, even though that's your freedom of speech, that could cause untold harm and possibly death. So that can that type of speech can be banned. Now, clear and present danger is a rather nebulous term, and that can be instituted or interpreted, I should say, in a lot of different ways. So the government, during times of war, is oftentimes given more and more power in order to deal with those scenarios. John Blackjack Pershing of Spanish American War and San Juan Hill fame is going to be appointed as the overall commanding of the AEF, America's Army being sent overseas, the American Expeditionary Force. Remember, he gets the nickname Black Jack because he was the commander of an all-black troop that was fighting during the Spanish-American War. However, when he gets overseas, he refuses to leave our doughboys, as they were nicknamed, uh, fight with the French and the British. Now, what I mean by that is we would not be simply used as replacements in British and French units. We would not be taking our guys and putting them under the control of British or French commanders. However, that would change later on in some instances. We wanted to fight separately 
Americans given their own place in the line with their own commanders. And Pershings uh, doggedly stuck to that. This war would drag on. I've talked to you about that uh, with trench warfare and the type of war that was fought, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, there would be problems all along the Western Front. After Russia had pulled out, Germany rushed millions of its troops to the Western Front. And when it looked like the Germans were just about to get the upper hand, the United States enters. And once again, it starts to become a stalemate until eventually a couple of things happen. One is propaganda because of uh, Wilson's 14-point peace plan, which we'll discuss in detail. And the other was the slaughter that was taking place in the trenches was causing disillusionment among all of the troops. There would be mutiny, if you will, on ships, on both sides. There would be mutiny in the trenches on both sides, men refusing to go over the top, men, entire units refusing to fight. But this became more of an epidemic among the Germans. And eventually, the German fleet refused to fight. Uh, entire brigades of German troops uh, just started walking home. So on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 11, 11, 11, an armistice would be signed, a ceasefire. It would be signed in that railroad car that you see, on a railroad siding in the forest of Compiègne. I point this out specifically because that's going to come back again to haunt the very men that you see standing there. The allies who embarrass Germany inside that railroad car will have the tables turned in World War II. The aftermath of the Just take a look at the number of deaths per day, per day. Crimean War, the American Civil War, the Balkans War. Now, compare that to World War I. 5,000 deaths per day. Now, we're going to take a look at the uh, end of the movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, by Eric Marie Remarque. Uh, this was a look at the horror of World War I and trench warfare from the German standpoint. This was an anti-war book and an anti-war movie made in the United States and in England. In the beginning, and you should have watched that now, if you haven't, please do so, uh, the early clip showing you the high school teacher of these young German boys and encouraging them to quit school, join, the German army, before the war is over, to capture glory. This shows you one of those boys coming back to his class near the end of the war to talk. The farms they have gone, from the schools, from the factories, they have gone bravely, nobly, ever forward, realizing that there is no other duty now but to save the father. Oh! How are you, Paul? Glad to see you, Professor. You come at the right moment, Bowman. Just at the right moment. And as if to prove all I have said, here is one of the first to go. A lad who sat before me on these very benches, who gave up all to serve in the first year of the war. One of the iron youth who have made Germany invincible in the field. Look at him. Sturdy and bronze and clear-eyed, the kind of soldier every one of you should envy. Oh, lad, you must speak to them. You must tell them what it means to serve your father, lad. No, no, I can't tell them anything. You must, Paul. Just a word. Just tell them how much they're needed out there. Tell them why you went, what it meant to you. I can't say anything. If you remember some deed of heroism, some touch of nobility, tell about it.
I can't tell you anything you don't know. We live in the trenches out there. We fight. We try not to be killed. Sometimes we are. That's all. No. No, Paul. I've been there. I know what it's like. That's not what one dwells on, Paul. I heard you in here reciting that same old stuff. Making more iron men, more young heroes. You still think it's beautiful and sweet to die for your country, don't you? We used to think you knew. The first bombardment taught us better. It's dirty and painful to die for your country. When it comes to dying for your country, it's better not to die at all. There are millions out there dying for their country. And what good is it? Oh. Paul! You ask me to tell them how much they're needed out there? He tells you, go out and die. No, oh, but if you'll pardon me, it's easier to say go out and die than it is to do it. Coward! And it's easier to say it than to watch it happen. You're a coward! You're a coward! You're a coward! No, no, fine, fine. I'm sorry, Balmer, but I must it's say... no use talking like this. You won't know what I mean. Only, it's been a long while since we enlisted out of this classroom. So long, I thought maybe the whole world had learned by this time. Only now they're sending babies. And they won't last a week. I shouldn't have come on leave. Up at the front, you're alive or you're dead, and that's all. And you can't fool anybody about that very long. And up there, we know we're lost and done for, whether we're dead or alive. Three years we've had of it. Four years. And every day a year. And every night a century. And our bodies are earth. And our thoughts are clay. And we sleep and eat with death. And we're done for because you can't live that way and keep anything inside you. I shouldn't have come on leave. I'll go back tomorrow. I've got four days more, but I can't stand it here. I'll go back tomorrow. I'm sorry. Encouraged by that teacher, Paul Baumer, uh, led his entire high school class to sign up. He will be the only survivor when he comes back to the school. The rest are all dead. Uh, the end of the movie, he does go back to the front. He's in a trench as a sniper looking around and he sees a butterfly. He reaches for the butterfly and then of course he reveals himself and he will be killed by his sniper on the other side. The war ends, the war to make the world safe for democracy. The armistice was celebrated in the streets as the war ended on November 11th, 1918. In the trenches, war-weary soldiers ceremoniously kept their guns. Who do they hail as the individual that made all this happen? Woodrow Wilson. Wilson is the hero because it's going to be him and the United States presentation of the grounds for peace that brings the war to an end. Actually, the war would have ended sooner, but when the Germans and the Austrian-Hungarians approach Wilson about bringing about an armistice, he refuses unless ex it's exactly on his terms. Now remember, an armistice is simply a ceasefire. It is not the armistice to end the war. Friend, his aim is to save them and the world from the folly of future wars. He is the first American president to set foot in Europe during his term of office. Paris welcomes him. The streets are gay with bunting. His name on every lip. Thousands line the sides of the broad avenue Champs-Élysées as his carriage comes around the Arc de Triomphe. Wilson rides on the right of President Poincaré of France, while Mrs. Wilson and Madame Poincaré follow in a flower-filled carriage. The wide expanse of the Place de la Concorde is blocked with cheering masses of citizenry and soldiery as Paris, capital of the Allied world, takes Wilson to her arms. The people of England call, and he crosses the English Channel. Mrs. Wilson is with him, and also Admiral Grayson, friend and physician, ever watchful of the man who has become the spokesman of the Allied world and for whose health he is responsible. It is the first time those historic waters have been crossed by an American president. The 
Wilson's doctor, Admiral Grayson, begged him not to go because Wilson physically was on rather shaky ground. But go, he did. Remember a little bit about Wilson. He was an individual who was an idealist. He believed that God spoke to him. And now he goes through the streets of Paris where literally millions, millions chant his name. The same thing happens to England. He then returns to France to participate in the peace negotiations. He will present his 14 points and chief among them would be the League of Nations, an international organization of all nations resolved to settle all disputes peacefully. There in the Great Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, right outside of Paris, the negotiations would take place. Where's Waldo? Mark Wilson. This would be a treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, that ends World War I, but this treaty would be the treaty of the of World War II. 